Today we'll tell you about what we think is one of the best two-player games ever made. In the words of ABBA, Watergate promised to love you forevermore. Jeez, this game is great. In Watergate, you'll take on the role of the Washington Post or Nixon's administration in a head-to-head -head battle that has reverberated throughout history. Of course, no living person exists to remember the Watergate scandal because it happened in the early 70s and at the ripe age of 30, we give ourselves to the carousel to be renewed. I wonder what the world would be like if the Washington Post succeeded and Nixon resigned. I guess we'll never know. On June 17, 1972, five men broke into the offices of the Democratic National Committee and got caught. That would have been that, but the persistence of journalists Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein at the Washington Post uncovered a conspiracy that led all the way to Tricky Dick. Here's how it works. Each person is given a deck of 20 cards unique to that player. Each card can move tokens or alternatively enact an event or instead of an event, a conspirator for the Nixon player or a journalist for the Washington Post player. Each round players will play cards one after another, pulling strings in a game where it's impossible to win every battle. You just have to pick the right battles so you can win the war. Nixon needs momentum to win. If at the end of the round the momentum pip is on his side of the research track, he will be able to claim it and place it on his card. As soon as he collects five, he will win the game. It is, after all, momentum that makes his cheeks shake so radiantly. Whereas the WAPO is after evidence tokens. Each round Nixon places three of them face down on the research track. Anytime the editor player plays a card for its movement value, they declare a color. If there are any evidence tokens matching that color, Nixon will reveal one of them and move it that many steps closer to the editor player on the research track. If at the end of the round any of them end up on their side of the research track, they get to place them on the evidence board, drawing a path from informants all the way to the president. Trace an uninterrupted path from two informants to Nixon and the Washington Post player wins. So this is the cool bit. Clearly each player has their own conditions for winning, but their opponent's winning conditions are also incredibly appealing. So let's say I, as the Washington Post player, manage to gain a momentum token. That's cool. If I place enough of them on my card, I will get to trigger cool one-time effects. Whereas Nixon gets to place face down evidence tokens on the evidence board, literally bulldozing pathways to victory. This is what makes Watergate gate. I mean, what to gate, uh, I'm confused. Don't mistake this ropey looking map for something bland and abstract. Watergate is dynamic. It's spatial puzzle following a reactionary evolution based on what each player does. If the post is making a beeline for Butterfield, you could respond drastically, creating roadblocks, ruthlessly cutting off the flow of information. Or you could let them have it. Make them spend time and resources because secretly you know that Butterfield won't. Be an issue. Yes, the map is what makes Watergate good, but good games in 2019 are a dime a dozen. What makes Watergate one of the best two-player games ever, and yes, that is a verdict set in stone, is those two decks of cards. But we're not going to talk about them just yet. When we say one of the best two-player games, there is a caveat. What we actually mean is two-player only games. And you might think the difference is minute. After all, you could say play Gloomhaven at two players and have a whale of a time. So what gives Watergate a category of its own? The answer is psychology. Two player games are a familiar experience, but if there's a possibility for another person to join, even just the knowledge of that possibility makes it a little bit more comfortable. However, if the game within its scope singularly focuses you to engage with just one other person, then it's not hard to see why it could feel intimate, uncomfortable, and a little bit claustrophobic. That's because board games are an intimate experience. Not only do we share our time, our physical space, we share thought, we have friction, we mold ourselves together, only for a brief period, but we do. Sure, it's not an issue if you're sharing that experience with someone you're familiar with and comfortable like your significant other, but otherwise, a great two-player only game faces the biggest challenge. It not only has to be tight as a drum, but it has to be 
an amazing icebreaker too. And what better way to break the ice than with 40 absolute bonkers cards. The first time you play Watergate, you're gonna draw your starting hand of cards, look at them and go, I can do what now? And then the second time you play Watergate, you'll draw your opening hand of cards and go, I can do what now? And that feeling just doesn't go away. Let's go through some scenarios. Let's say the Washington Post moves the momentum token four steps towards themselves. Big move, but not as big as I was going to say tricky dick, but that feels wrong somehow. With one fell swoop, Nixon doesn't just move it back, but moves it all the way towards the last space on his track, which means it immediately moves off of the board and becomes his. In another example, the Washington Post player has been edging the momentum token towards themselves, and of course pulling on the evidence tokens, but you've kind of been edging them back to zero, only to reveal that your last card is Bob Holderman, who moves every evidence token one space on the research track meaning that at the end of that turn, they are all yours. Clearly all the cards in this game are mad and launched at the best possible time can unravel your opponent's plans in a heartbeat. Watergate establishes that as the norm and soon you'll find yourself in a world where nothing is certain and any move you make leading you into a potential death trap. But what if I told you that you're equally likely to lead yourself into an even bigger death trap, the death trap of being ineffective. Here's the tricky trick, Dick. You can either play a card for its movement value or the event. All the movement values range from one to four, and any event is frankly better than that, so why wouldn't you just play events all the time? Well, here's the thing. Whenever you play a card for its event value, it is removed from the game, permanently. Think about it, it's genius. One, if you play the best events, which are tied to the highest movement values, such as fours, then all you'll have circulating in your deck is trash. And then Alanis Morris said, ironically, you won't have the momentum to actually win the game. B, in a game with seemingly no real choice because each round you'll draw a hand of cards and then play all of them, you now not only have to figure out in which order you will play them, but whether you're gonna say goodbye to one, two, or perhaps all of your babies if the situation is really dire. If these cards are a magic bullet, then when is the time to shoot? 17, not all cards are events, and if they are not, if you play them for their event value means that you don't lose them, which, even though they are more situational, makes them even more special, because I can play them and do the thing, and then if I draw them again, I can play them again and do the thing again, unless, of course, my opponent is holding the exact right card to counter them, which means not only do I not get to do the thing, but just like the events, I lose it forever. Square! It's thematic. This one might seem obvious, but I'm quite glad that you can't replay the presidential election 1972 card over and over again, getting Nixon re-elected all the time as if some sort of a meta statement on authoritarianism. Not to mention that you can just restart the game as many times as you like and keep replaying history until you get the desired outcome, like a really gruesome version of Groundhog Day. I promise you, no matter how much you're scared of intimacy, you won't feel awkward playing Watergate because there's just no time. Every little thing you do feels special and there's no room for social claustrophobia. And look, Watergate isn't the first game to do this. There's a whole genre of them called Take That and most of them are terrible. You might be familiar with games like Munchkin, Flux, or Killer Bunnies, games I have no B-roll for because I wouldn't be caught dead owning a copy. I'm not arrogant, it's just that my job is reviewing board games, and I'd like to keep my reputation and, and my job as well. These games live and feed like leeches on the feeling of every card being stupid, overpowered, and very funny, if by chance you drew it at just the right time. Watergate doesn't even deserve being compared with them, but it is worth addressing why this Take That game is great, whereas others, by critical consensus, have long burned in the fires of wherever it is that bad board games go after they die. Leave your ideas in the comments. Structure, grounding. If I remove the events from Watergate, 
it would still be a game. It might not be the best game in the world, but it would still work. And that's because a lot of what's interesting about Watergate has nothing to do with these cards. If I'm playing as Nixon, do I just systematically dismantle every one of the informants, or do I surround myself with an impenetrable wall of dead leads? And whatever I choose, how will my opponent respond to it? The gameplay is emergent. Every action leads to a new game state that requires an equal response. And that's the magician's trick. Ask anyone why they hate Munchkin and they'll tell you, oh, it's just random. But smarter people than me have continuously proven that People don't hate randomness in games, they just hate how it's implemented. So when you have a game where randomness doesn't create anger and frustration, but instead presents opportunities and opens different paths, you have a real winner. This is the bit where a conclusion would go, but I think with some amplifying by yours truly, Watergate speaks for itself. So instead I'll leave you with this to think about. I opened up this video with a joke premise that Nixon had one and we now live in an alternate reality where things got so bad that we pretty much live in Logan's run. Well, there's a total of nine momentum tokens in this game. It is possible, of course, for the Washington Post to pick up five of them, triggering the impeachment event. Because there's only four tokens left that Nixon could get, does that mean that they automatically lose the game because they can't reach the win condition? Well, no, there's a special rule that says if this specific circumstance occurs, then Nixon can still win by claiming the four remaining momentum tokens, which feels like an odd and niche rule until you think about it and realize that after Nixon's resignation, his vice president then becoming president, Gerald Ford, pardoned him. So within the logic of this game and how it represents history, who is the real winner?